Hi everyone, welcome to week 6. I am your instructor, Dr. J, and we will cover two topics, negotiating access and research ethics, as well as collecting primary data through observations. Participants are a valuable part of the research process and not merely a means of accessing data. Ethical review provides protection for participants and also helps to protect the researcher. By obtaining ethical approval, the researcher is demonstrating that they have adhered to the accepted ethical standards of a genuine research study. Participants have the right to know who has access to their data and what is being done with it. If ethical approval has not been obtained, the individual researcher bears personal responsibility for any claims that may be made. Research funders will generally only fund research that has ethical approval and many publishers will not accept for publication results of research that was not ethically approved. Many students want to start their research as soon as they have identified a topic area, forgetting that access to ethics are critical aspects for the success of any research project. This section considers strategy that may help you to obtain physical, virtual, continuing and cognitive access to appropriate data. Before attempting to gain physical access, it is essential that you familiarize yourself fully with the characteristics of the organization or group. Figure 6.1 shows the ethical issues at different stages of research. Ethical issues are likely to be important throughout your research. This will require ethical integrity from you in relation to your role as the researcher, any organizational gatekeepers involved and where appropriate your research sponsor. Ethical issues need to be anticipated and considered from the very start of your research project. This will be from the time you start to think about the choice of your research topic. Each potential research topic will be associated with a number of possible ethical concerns. Consent to participate in a research project is not a straightforward matter. In general terms, an approach to a potential participant or respondent is an attempt to gain consent. However, this raises a question about the scope of any given consent. Where someone agrees to participate in a particular data collection method, this does not necessarily imply consent about the way in which the data provided may be used. Three points are outlined in Figure 6.2, although in reality this is likely to operate as a continuum because a multitude of positions are possible around the points described. For example, research that is conducted with those who have agreed to participate can still involve an attempt to deceive them in some way. The nature of information required for informed consent may vary according to your research strategy as will the way in which you seek to establish consent. If you are intending to use a questionnaire where personal data are not collected or where data are completely anonymized, the return of a completed questionnaire by a respondent is often taken to imply consent. When interviewing individuals, informed consent should be supplemented by a more detailed written agreement, such as a consent form, which is signed by both parties. Use of a written consent form helps to clarify the boundaries of consent and should help you to comply with data protection legislation where your research involves the collection of confidential, personal or sensitive personal data. As with audio recording, consent needs to be obtained before the event, given potential reluctance or sensitivity about using these types of recording media. Your consent form enabling this needs to be recorded formally. Let's move to the next topic on collecting primary data through observation. For your information, observation can serve as a data collection method for both qualitative and quantitative. 
For example, observing how many cups of coffee sold from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. daily is an example of a quantitative observation. And observing how the server greet customers is a qualitative observation. For this topic, we will look into the difference between participant observation, structured observation, and finally, the chapter summary. When a researcher has decided to collect data using the observation method, the researcher needs to conduct the observation in a systematic way that involves data recording, description analysis to enable them to interpret the people's behaviour. Researcher conducting the observation method can choose to play various roles. Let's look at these four examples. The first is the researcher as a complete participant, whereby you may use this method when you are already an insider in a particular organization or social setting. You usually don't inform your purpose as an observer, thus this may raise ethical issues as you have lacked of consent from the participants. You may be viewed as a spy. Researchers should not adopt this role where the focus of the research may result in risk to individuals with the potential to cause embarrassment or harm. The second role is the researcher choose to be participant as observer, whereby the researcher needs to be an insider in order to do this. The researcher will reveal their intention to the participant and will gain their consent and they will also become an active participant in any related activities. If researcher is an observer as participant, it will involve them to be the observer or spectator only. They will have moderate participation in any activities carried out by the participants and they will notify the participants of their purpose of becoming the observer. Finally, when the researcher becomes complete observer, they will not reveal their purpose to the participant and this will raise ethical issues. They will only become the spectator and data will be interpreted solely based on the judgment and opinion of the observer which can lead to biasness. In addition of the four roles discussed, researcher can also play roles such as as a non-participant observer and a collaborative observer. Non-participant observer is where researcher observe any scenario or social settings using technology such as online materials or television or radio programs. Collaborative observer is where researcher wants to overcome any ethical issues by informing participants of his or her purpose and inviting the participants to become observers as well. This type of observation will lead to informants being able to discuss the interpretation of the findings resulting in multiple interpretation of the data. As mentioned in the earlier slide, there are two main types of observation, participant observation and structured observation. What is participant observation? Participant observation is where the researcher attempts to participate fully in the lives and actions of subjects, enabling them to not merely observe what is happening but also feeling it. Researchers choosing to conduct participant observation needs to decide the right purpose of the research as well as choose the right time to observe. Secondly, researcher needs to decide if this is a suitable method to be conducted as this method requires researchers to immerse themselves in the research setting and directly experience the participation in the observation, activities and social settings. Researchers need to make sure if they are able to get full organizational access and this leads to many ethical considerations such as gaining full consent. Any type of observation needs to consider the validity of the data. 
and researchers must make sure that participant observation main purpose is to look at the perspective of the subject and not the researcher's point of view. The next slide will discuss the advantages and disadvantages of participant observation. Here are the advantages of conducting participant observation. First, participant observation is good at explaining what is going on in a particular social situation. Next, it heightens the researcher's awareness of significant social process. It is also particularly useful for researchers working within their own organization. Some participant observation affords the opportunity to really experience the emotions of those who are being researched. Finally, virtually all data collected are useful. There are also disadvantages of conducting participant observation, such as it can be very time-consuming, it can pose difficult ethical dilemmas for the researchers, and they can be high levels of role conflict for the researcher. The closeness of the researcher to the situation being observed can also lead to significant observer bias. The participant-observer role is a very demanding one, to which not all researchers will be suited. It is also difficult to gain full access to organizations and data recording is often very difficult for the researcher. Now, let's move to structured observation. Structured observation uses high level of predetermined structure. It is a methodology in which an event or series of events is observed in its natural setting and recorded systematically by an independent researcher. Structured observation is a qualitative research methodology that has been used by the social sciences for several years. It is a methodology in which an event or series of events is observed in its natural setting and recorded by an independent researcher. The observations are structured in the sense that predetermined categories are used to guide the recording process. Structured observation is also systematic and comprehensive, allowing an observer to record data in predetermined increments during a specified period of time. For example, we can observe an interaction between chefs during food preparations and the behaviours that precede and follow food preparation. Thus, structured observations may help us to understand at what moments and why the chefs wash their hands. The following shows three issues relating to validity and reliability of structured observation. First, subject error. For example, if you wanted to observe the competency of tea life workers, however, on the day of your observation, the worker you observed is a new worker and that is his first day. This will result in the validity and reliability of the observation. Second, time error may happen when you observe the situation at a wrong time. For example, you wanted to observe a viral restaurant, but you have chosen Monday 8 a.m. as your observation time. This is not a suitable time that people visit a viral restaurant and will cause validity and reliability of your observation. To overcome this, observer can use habituation and minimal interaction. Here is an example of predetermined behavior coding on delighting the customer when workers work in a fast food chain. The internet allows access to huge amount of data that will enable researchers to conduct internet-mediated observation. Please conduct the following group class activity. In your group, read, understand and discuss regarding internet-mediated observation from the textbook. Illustrate a creative mind map to represent the full topic of internet-mediated observation. Only group representative will submit the task in ULEARN platform. You may submit in PowerPoint form or PDF form. Let's summarize this chapter. Participant observation is used in a wide range of social settings. Participant observation means adopting a number of potential roles and roles are differentiated according to the degree 
of concealed identity and participation in events adopted by the researcher. The aim of participant observation is to develop theory and avoid mere storytelling. Structured observation is concerned with the frequency of events. It is characterized by high levels of predetermined structure and quantitative analysis. The main threats to reliability and validity are subject error, time error, and observer effects. That is all for today's topic. Dr. J here signing off. Take care. Bye-bye.